Um, great, thanks Ben, um, and hello everybody. Um, ben and I met uh, years ago at various different JavaScript conferences. Uh, I think uh, he was playing at them and I went, man, your music is amazing, this is fantastic, and we kind of became friends over the years. And we were talking recently, and he asked, you know, what I was up to and stuff, and some JavaScript related things. And I said, well, you know, I mostly do Clojure and Clojure Script and Python now. I'm a consultant here in town, and I mostly focus on, I spend my time on kind of data engineering, uh, data science, kind of machine learning type things. And those are the three languages I use Clojure, Clojure Script, and Python to do those things. And, uh, so he said, well, you want to talk at the Node thing? I'm like, well, you know, it's Clojure Script. It's not really JavaScript. I don't know. I don't want to go into an angry audience and tell them about something that they don't do or, or whatever. And he's like, no, it'll be good. It'll be good. So he said, just come and maybe talk about what you do or why you do it or whatever, and then we can all kind of learn as to why a seemingly rational, you know, moderately intelligent person would do something other than the pure essence of JavaScript or whatever, why I would consider using a transpiled language on top of ClojureScript. So the talk tonight is just about that, about why I do that or what I, what I find valuable in it, and then maybe you guys can uh, uh, get some insight out of that. So first of all, what even is ClojureScript? So ClojureScript is a Lisp. Um, it, it's related to Clojure, which is a, another Lisp, that tar and ClojureScript targets the uh, JavaScript. So it compiles into JavaScript and runs on JavaScript environments. Clojure is a Lisp that targets the JVM. So it runs on, uh, on it, it targets Java, you know, it runs on the JVM. So wherever you would run, run Java uh, or the JVM, you could run Clojure instead. And then wherever you would run uh, JavaScript, you could run Clo uh, Clojure script if you wanted to. It, Clojure script has great interop with uh, with JavaScript, with Node, and Clojure with the JVM. Uh, as such, ClojureScript runs in browsers, it runs on Node.js, it runs in where you would use React Native, so that's almost you know, in, embedded in, in iPhones and stuff, and, and in Android devices. It also runs on JavaScript Core, which is uh, Apple's JavaScript engine that's on your desktop and stuff, so you could write like native things that run on, uh, like outside of Node, but kind of like in a Node environment. Uh, it runs anywhere that JavaScript, or almost anywhere that JavaScript runs. And it's about six years old, um, and it's been awesome for about five years. <laughs> so I really like it a lot. Um, so it's established, you know, it's also kind of a fringe thing, not everybody in the world. It's not as popular as everything else, but um, it's a really solid production ready kind of thing. So why ClojureScript? And this is like my take on it. Uh, I really like ClojureScript because it's simple, it's functional. It's immutable by default. The data is immutable. And uh, the philosophy behind it is very, very data oriented. So a lot of programming, a lot of languages maybe are object oriented and some are functional. Uh, Clojure and Clojure Script tend to be functional uh, first, but then they also tend to approach things in a very data oriented way. And I will talk about that a little bit more uh, you know, throughout the talk. Um, but first, let's say, what makes languages different? You know, like, why would we consider one language A versus language B? Um, and in a very real sense, languages are kind of equivalent, you know? Like, when you add two numbers together in one language, you can add two numbers together in the other language. And, like, there's this informal kind of concept of Turing completeness, and it's not technically, technically correct, but basically they say that it says that all languages are kind of... Can, anything you can compute in one language, you can compute in another one, so at some level, there's no difference between them. But there are practical differences, right? And the practical differences that we think of, and this is like kind of the hierarchy I made up. I don't think I, I mean, if, if, it's a, if it's a good hierarchy, I stole it from somebody. And if it's a kind of a bad hierarchy, kind of a bad framework, it's just something I made up uh, you know, to kind of help, help me think through this and help, uh, help me to explain it to things, to people, right? So the differences, the practical differences might be things like the syntax, that's the first thing we think of. But I would, I'm gonna, Posit here that the syntax is actually the least important in difference, right? Because you can get used to a different syntax. We all, it's just an opinion, the syntax. And then instead of features, I'm going to say focus. Is what the designers of the language, the, the, the committee that controls the language, the, uh, you know, the benef benevolent dictator that controls the language, what they focus on and how, what kind of trade-offs they make for that language. That's really the important thing. And then that will then, in time, generate an ecosystem for that language. Because somebody says, I really want this language to be easy. 
easy for new developers, then that language is going to develop tools and an ecosystem that's uh, easy for new developers. If they say, I want this language to have this, this capability, then it's going to kind of develop and grow in, those, in that way. So by focus, I mean, like not the features themselves, but kind of what does the language allow, you know, what does it encourage, and what does it enforce? And like we said, allow, the language is kind of equivalent, so in many ways, any language is going to allow anything, right? And like there's this old talk, there's this old comment about any sufficiently complicated C or Fortran program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half of common lisp, okay? So forget he says common lisp. You could, re you, could, you could replace any language in there. You can say that any sufficiently complicated lower level language, application written in a lower level language, is going to have uh, a not great implementation of some higher level language. So if you really wanted a flexible C application, you're going to end up writing something that kind of looks like JavaScript to kind of, you know, you're going to write your own object-oriented framework on top of it to, to get a dynamic thing out of C. So allow is kind of a, uh, a really weak kind of uh, attribute of a language. Encourage. This is kind of the interesting thing. So does your language encourage object-oriented programming? Does it encourage functional programming? Does it encourage this feature or does it encourage that feature? Because you, like again, you could have C that allows object-oriented programming because you could just write C++ using C or you could just write JavaScript using C. Um, but does it actually encourage that? And then enforce. Some languages tend to enforce specific features, specific things. Okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> now, uh, like strong typing versus weak typing, does it enforce that, those types of things? So these are the things, the kind of the dimensions that maybe we could think about when we think about different languages. And so when I say ClojureScript's focus, is really about a simple, simplicity, and simple is not easy. So it doesn't really make your life easy, it kind of just tries to make things simple for you so you can figure them out, which I think a lot of people uh, are uncomfortable with when they first come to it. They're used to something like Rails. Like you do one command and boom, you get like this magical thing. But it's magical and it's easy to get started, but it's kind of complicated in that it's doing a lot of things that it's kind of hard to maybe to figure out what's going on. Um, anyway, so it's, uh, so it's very simple. It focuses on functional and it focuses on immutable data and it focuses on data-oriented programming. So. Even though I said the syntax is the least important thing, let me throw this out here because I know it's the, uh, the white elephant in the room or whatever, the elephant in the room, and it's got parentheses. And you go, Lisp, oh, doesn't it have like a million parentheses? I hate parentheses, oh, parentheses suck. Well, no, parentheses, are, they're like a little hug for your code, okay? They just like, they just surround your code and they bring it in and they, they love your code, right? And I know you guys can handle this. I know this is not a big deal, okay? Because here I have a line of JavaScript. It's got two parentheses, and I've got an equivalent line of Lisp. And it has like a million parentheses, but you can only see two of them, okay? So there are only two parentheses up there. And we don't need the commas, and we don't need the semicolon. JavaScript doesn't have the doesn't semicolon, but you know, it's a lot simpler. All it is is that we bring the function name inside of the parentheses, so the parentheses go on the outside. That's all it is. Now you know. Lisp syntax, okay? Let me talk about, um, I didn't know people would, would want to check this out, but there's this um, website, it's a, I forget like what it's called in JavaScript. It's a website called uh, Clips uh, Tech, where you can type in uh, ClojureScript on the left, it shows you what the JavaScript, what JavaScript it compiles to on the right, it shows you what the result is, and it shows you what the console output is. So if you want to really play around with what happens, you can, you can use that. All right, so let me give you a really quick overview of ClojureScript or Lisp, um, especially the data structures, uh, and this is like half the language. Okay, list, parentheses really mean a list. And the special, and it's just a linked list kind of thing. So when I say open paren, my fun, one, a2, close paren, that's a list of three things. The thing about, uh, about per, uh, list is that the first thing in the list is by default interpreted to be some kind of function, so the system tries to run that. It says, I'm going to call the first thing on the list with everything else in the list as, uh, as an argument. So that's how you get the system to run things, right? Um, if you don't want the system to run things, you can quote it. So you can say, quote, my fun two, three. It'll parse it and give you back a list. And you can run that list later if you wanted, you know? So this is like the first kind of functional thing that you can run these things whenever you'd like. But 
open uh, parentheses are lists, and lists by default try to run the first thing. If I were to write open paren one, two, three, that would be a list with three numbers in it. If I just do that, the system's gonna say, hey, okay, I'm gonna run this. It's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna run one. And it's like, one's not a function. So it says, hey, uh, I don't know what to do here. You gave me one, and it's not a function. I can't run that. Um, so, but if you just want a list of one, two, three, you just quote it, and you're good to go. Everything else is like that. Def is define, you know? We wanted to save those four extra characters and not type out define, but it's def. Def A1 is going to define a symbol called A1 that's going to have the value, the list 1, 2, 3. Def A2 define a symbol called uh, A2. Uh, the name A2 is going to have the value uh, 1, 2, 3. And then you can compare those. Those are two different lists, but you, compare, you can compare them with an equals values, with, a, with the equals sign. This is the first part of what I said. It's very data oriented, value oriented. So if two things have the same values, they equality, the, the equality is the same. Okay? Okay, so it used to be in the old days that lists were like the, basically the only data structure that lists had, uh, but this is a modern Lisp, and we have more data structures, so we have vectors. Vectors are just arrays. They're square brackets. You can put anything you want in a vector, including A1. That could be the list from the previous slide. So the first thing in this list is a list of 1, 2, 3. The next thing is the floating point 3.0. Uh, next thing is another vector, so you can have vectors inside of vectors. It's fine. The next thing I have here is a set, a hash, Curly brace is a set, so now I've got the set one, two, three, which is different than the list one, two, three, and the vector one, two, three, kind of technically different, you know? But they're the same values. All right, the other way you define things is with the let, with the let thing. Let has been around in Lisp since 1950 or something, right? So let lets you define local variables, and you have a vector of pairs of things where the first thing is of the symbol, the second thing is the value, the third thing is the symbol, you know, fourth thing is the value, and so on and so on, as long as you like. So here I'm saying the symbol A1 takes the value of the vector 1, 2, 3, A2 takes the, the value of the list 1, 2, 3, inside this locally scoped let block, you know? And then I can compare, even though I have lists and, um, and vectors, the, they have the same values, they, they are functionally equivalent also. So I, they are the same thing, the, the values one, two, three. So very value-based, very data-based, okay? And then maps, this is the most complicated thing of all. This is, uh, uh, some languages call them hashes, some call dicks, some call JSON objects, or whatever, JavaScript objects. Um, and we can have, I'm introducing a new thing, a keyword. A keyword is colon and a name. It's basically a string, an intern string, if you know that term. It's just a, a kind of a string that's only ever one of, and so you can just treat it like a, like, it's a symbol, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a keyword, we call it. Uh, so it's pairs of key value pairs. Uh, key A1 has the value uh, a string. This is a double plus good. This, you can put strings as keys also. So the string A1 has the value of an actual date, you know? In other languages, some languages, you, can all, you can't represent dates, you have to represent them as strings, and so you need to always parse them or whatever, but you can have actual dates here. Plus, plus is a function, it's just a regular function like any other function. And you can have a function be a key in your map. So maybe you wanna um, have some documentation for a bunch of functions, and so you wanna be able to look up the documentation based on the function, so you could have a function and a string. Cool, okay? You could have the function plus be the value in your map. That's fine too. And so I have the keyword plus, and then the value uh, of a, the function is the, is the function plus. So that starts to look like an object maybe, where you can you know, have fields that have functions in them and you can look them up. So it's a functional language, but you can start building, sometimes you do want really minimal object-oriented kind of flexibility, you can start doing that by just putting functions in your maps and then passing the maps around as the prototype for the type of thing that you want to do. Um, that's not super common, but it is, it's something you see. And the other thing is you can have any, any data structure as a key or a value, so you can have something like a cache. Wherever you have the vector one, two, you want to return the list four, five, six, that's cool, you can store, store that in there and it, it totally works as the map, okay? And I swear that is like, 80% of Lisp right there, right? I'm not gonna go into the, the fun, into a couple, like you have to how to define a function or whatever because this is in a Lisp class, but I just wanted to talk about the data structures because the data structures, oh wait, oh, commas. I know some of you like commas and maybe you're like, oh, there's no white space. Commas are white space. So you can add as many commas as you want wherever you want them, it's cool, you know? If you like 
comma, 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 it's cool. And my personal favorite is that since they're optional, this comma is optional. I hate that comma. That comma causes me, you know, like so much trouble in JSON and in Python. Whenever you go to delete that last argument or that last thing and you forget to delete the comma or you try to add it and you forget to add the comma, it things break and so. It's a simple, it's a little thing, but the commas are optional, so it doesn't matter. All right, so that's really 80% of the syntax. It's really straightforward. These are the key data structures and you build everything out of these things. The, key, the cool thing, and the cool thing that I think is really key to Clojure and the, one of the, the big focuses that make it different from other languages, other mainstream languages, is the immutability. Once you create one of these data structures, you cannot change that data structure, right? It's always the same, right? And you're probably thinking, or if you haven't seen immutability before, you're thinking, well, how do you program anything if you can't change your data? It's like, we'll get to that. But first, I want to talk about why, okay? Because when you have mutable data, it's like programming like this. You poke your program in one spot and something else somewhere else changes, okay? It really, like, I don't think I'm the only one that had, I'm not gonna take a poll, but I don't think I'm the only one that has this experience where you try to do something one place and it breaks something completely different. That's because you've got some global mutable state somewhere and you don't understand what all the interconnections are and it's really difficult to debug something like that. But if you have immutable data, you, those types of problems uh, they don't disappear, but they, they really, really are reduced in scope, okay? Why is that? So with mutability, if I have A an array that's two, one, three, and I call sort on A, what is the value of A? The sorted array. It depends. I, I posit it depends, it depends on the language. A lot of languages will sort in place, other languages will not sort in place, will give you back a sorted array. So you don't know if A changes or not in this language. And this isn't just made up, this isn't specifically JavaScript or, or anything. And I've got some Python-ish kind of things later on. But you don't really know. And every, every language is different. In some languages, it kind of depends on, on what library you're using, whether it's sorting in place or not, right? If you say, okay, well, and, and sometimes that's done for performance reasons or something. But if you say like, enclosure, immutable by default, Almost 99% of the time, you're not going to change A, so the value of A is still 213. That's not the case in a lot of places, okay? I have an A, it's 213. I call a function on A, and then I call sort on A. What's the value of A? Let's say it is sorted in place. So let's, let's just go with that. Again, huh? I, again, we don't know. We don't know. And I'm exaggerating, I'm making this like a big point because it's, you know, I, because it's a talk. I have to like kind of exaggerate stuff a little bit. Um, we don't know because we don't know what foobar does, right? We don't know if foobar is changing A, if it's adding some numbers, if it's removing numbers, if it's changing all the numbers to something else. So maybe it's going and looking up, taking those numbers and looking them up in some database or something and replacing them with pictures of kittens. It could be. And then when you go to sort A, you don't have the numbers anymore, you, ha you have a, uh, a list of kittens, right? So it's not what you expected. So you never know what you have there. With immutability, you know A is 213. You can say C equals A. You can call foobar on A. Doesn't matter what foobar does, A will always be 213. You can say sort on A, and then that's assign that to B, and B will be 123. You can take A, sort it, reverse it. Now A actually refers to a brand new array that's 3, 2, 1, and C still refers to the old array of 2, 1, 3. So all those values stay and work the way you want and they're never changed, okay? I think that's huge, okay? I don't know if other people do, but whatever. Uh, so I think that's huge. I think this is probably like the main thing that really like brought me to Clojure and Clojure Script is when you're building bigger programs, the ability to have, to really know what your values are and to know that things are not gonna change under you is really key. Um, especially, oh, so the, I was gonna say, so 
what is FUBAR doing there if we're not using what it returns, you know? So it might be saving stuff to database, it might be getting stuff, I don't know. But that's the first thing I would look at. I was like, oh, you know, FUBAR was really getting kittens. I really need to kind of get those kittens and keep them in a different array. So this is kind of more what I would expect uh, from a program, something like that. Or if I saw this, I would, like, FUBAR would be suspicious. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as to why would I call FUBAR if I wasn't using the return value. Um, and then again, with immutability, you could have all kinds of parallel, asynchronous, uh, concurrent stuff, and it all sorts out. You don't have race conditions because your values are not going to change. Um, you don't have to worry about two different threads or uh, uh, hitting the same value or two different you know, callbacks kind of manipula uh, manipulating things in different orders depending on when the callbacks uh, complete. Okay, so immutability. That was like the key thing in that focus that I said that drives everything else. It uh, simplifies your, your reasoning of your programs. It simplifies the concurrency and parallelism. It simplifies testing because you don't need to like configure some crazy state in, some, in your program to test like one little thing. You can always just test it directly. And it simplifies uh, functional programming. It leads into functional programming. And functional programming for the, for the way I want to define it here, for the way I want to talk about it, it, it really means first class functions. Uh, you can pass functions around. Functions can, you can do, you can store them, you can save them, you can do what you need to do. Um, functional composition or building things up based on functions rather than on objects. And this concept of pure functions and side affecting functions. A pure function, it's always the same input, you always get the same output. It doesn't rely on any external mutable state or anything like that, and there are no side effects. Uh, a side affecting function, uh, is kind of the opposite. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get back. It's always, it, it can be different. It kind of depends on what's in the database or whatever. So the foobar we saw before, the only reason it, it existed is, is it had to be a side affecting function. It had to do something with the external world because I was passing it A's and I didn't care what the result was. So that means it, if, if it's doing anything useful to me, it is saving things to a database or something like that. So side affecting functions, they're necessary, but they're going to cause you problems. They're going to be harder to test because now you've got to manage the database, you've got to manage the, the network connection or whatever. So the whole strategy is to minimize them and control them. Put them all in its own little place where you can kind of keep an eye on them. And everything else, as much as possible, uh, could be pure functions that you always give it some data and it's always going to give you back the same thing back and you never have to worry about, um, well, and you can test that. So as an example, is we have a really typical thing, we have a bunch of customers and we need to update their payment stuff or something, right? So we write this function, it says update customer, we get customer, we do some crazy tests to see if they need to be changed, we modify them, and then we save the customer. So if we wanted to test something like this, we'd have to like um, create a customer in the database that doesn't have a payment method. We'll create one that has a payment method, that has an expired payment method, we'll create one that has an invalid payment method, and all these things. We've got to create them in the database. However, if we start using this functional approach of pure and impure functions, we could extract the business logic into a separate function, a pure function, and then have an impure function do the uh, reading and the writing from the database. What this then means is, is that we can test the update, we still need to test the update customer, make sure we're reading and writing to the database correctly. But once that works, we don't need to mess with that anymore, and we could spend all our time on the business logic function. The business logic function just gets a customer before, figures out what needs to change, and then returns a changed customer, a new, a new customer that's new change thing. And we can, setting that up is really easy. It's just as straightforward as, as creating those maps we had before where we had like the payment invalid, payment expired, payment great, payment whatever. We can always test that and we always know exactly what's going on with that. And then just to be a little bit more complete, I'm like, okay, well, we're always getting the thing from the get customer thing. We're going to pass in the thing, get an updated customer, and then save the updated customer. So we're always changing or creating a new data structure based on an old data structure. So when I say modify, I don't mean change the old one. I mean create a new one based on the old one. All right. So I said simplicity, um, immutable data. That was all data and immutability. Uh, simplicity because, uh, well, and then data oriented, and then the ecosystem. And I think that the fact that we have uh, immutable data and kind of a functional programming thing built on top of JavaScript and JVM 
gives us a really amazing ecosystem, okay? Um, it does that, be, and it gives us a really amazing reach because if you wanted to run something, you know, running it on the JVM and running it on Node is just, and in the browser, like that's a lot of places, you know? That's not every place, that's a lot of places. So um, if you want to do a single page app, uh, there's a framework. I would suggest re a bunch of frameworks, but uh, we suggest Reagent, which wraps React, Reframe, which gives you an Elm Flux type architecture on top of that, and Figwheel that gives you um, on the fly compiling and loading into a browser. Okay? It's fantastic. It is amazing. It is simple to set up. I'm sure you could do it. If you're a front end developer, you could do it with a bunch of programs now and stuff, but uh, I'm telling you, it, it's amazing, and Clojure's been doing it for like two years. It's really, really good. And the, you program with functions, and this is just a simple function called defn, so it's a defined function called simple component, takes no arguments. So the empty array, the empty vector means that's my argument vector, it's empty, I don't take anything. And all it does is return a vector of keywords and strings that represent my, uh, the, the DOM that, that the React is gonna create for me. But it's a vector, it's not even functions at this point. So what that means is I can manipulate that data any way I want. I can change, just like I would change any other data structure, I could change that component on the fly based on anything I'd like. It's a data structure. It means I can read the data structure off the wire. I don't have to, it's not, I'm not like embedding code or whatever, it's actually just data. It means I can read that data structure off a file. It means I can read that data structure as an HTML file, parse it, and create the data structure. So I've got like a templating language built in where designers can code in HTML and it automatically gets turned into, into something that I can feed to React, you know, into data structures that I can feed into React. So it is amazing. That, that's the other thing about data and data-oriented that I wanted to, to bring out here. I think it is super, super powerful. And this data-oriented thing is just amazing and it, it just, we end up programming in ways where we use data as, as even meta configuration, like ways to configure the program, the actual code we're running just by configuring data. So, so single page apps, fantastic. I mean, I really love uh, reagents and reframe. Node apps, there are, uh, you can run ClojureScript in Node. You can run, a, you can create a full web app using a framework called Macchiato. Templating language, request, response, all that stuff. It all runs in ClojureScript using these concepts of immutable data and functional programming and everything. It's fantastic. There are also, Luo is ClojureScript that automatically boots into Node. So you can just say Lumo on your command line and you get a ClojureScript REPL that's running in a, node, in a Node process. So you can use that to write command line programs or whatever you want, you know. Uh, Plank is the same thing but for JavaScript core. So it runs on Mac. Um, so this is particularly hot. Uh, the last two, because people like Clojure, uh, nobody likes the JVM startup time. The JVM itself is actually pretty fast, like once, once it gets going, but getting it going is, is, is slow. Nobody likes the JVM startup time, so everybody has, has gone to writing things that just run really quickly, like a command line thing, um, in Clojure script using Lumo and Plank, because those start up instantaneously, they run your code, and then it's done, and, and whatever it is you need to do. So if you need to do little utilities, people are writing those. So Node apps. React Native. So you wanna do React Native, the framework there is uh, Renatal. You could use ClojureScript, just like we were doing, to write uh, components for your uh, native mobile apps. Serverless. Um, this is one, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a package called CLJS Lambda, which lets you write Clojure script that gets compiled into JavaScript and then gets loaded into a serverless AWS thing, you know, a Lambda thing. Um, this is one where we don't get as much support as you do with pure uh, JavaScript, uh, like the, with serverless framework, whatever. Um, you get a lot of support and, and uh, we don't, uh, the, pick, the story's not as complete for like, uh, Google Cloud Functions or Azure Cloud Functions, whatever they're called, there aren't like a lot of libraries to do that. But if you can get something running in JavaScript, there's usually a way to just compile ClojureScript. Uh, oh, so ClojureScript can call JavaScript and JavaScript can call ClojureScript. And uh, the only trick is to figure out what your ClojureScript function is gonna be called. And then you just pass that a name in in, in whatever configuration stuff you have for your Google Cloud functions or your Azure functions or whatever. Does that make sense? 
Like you say, hey, I want to create a, a serverless function. I want to call it foo. Or when somebody requests foo, call my thing, like you know, julio.myproject.foo function. And, and that'll end up calling a closure script function that you, or a function you wrote in closure script that got compiled into JavaScript. So it'll work. You just, a, that's a little trick there. So advanced features, it's got something called core async. So even in single-threaded uh, JavaScript kind of situation, you can have kind of a queue-based, kind of a go loop, uh, go, yeah, go loop kind of base thing where you can put jobs on a queue, and then you can read jobs off a queue and process them all. Um, and it looks really concurrent, even though it's all single-threaded, and it's really straightforward, and it, it works well. There's something called spec, which lets you, it's not a strong typing or, uh, yeah, it's not a strong typing. Uh, it's more like validation or contracts for particular functions. And it's function, so like you could say, so you can say this function takes an integer. That's like the basic thing. And then you can turn it on, you can turn it off. And then whenever you call that function with something that's not an integer, the system will go, hey, that's not an integer. You, you called it with a string, you know, there's a problem here. But it's a little bit more than that because the way the specs are defined, the specs themselves are in closure or closure script. So you can define the specs in closure script. You can say not only does function take an integer, it takes an even integer. It takes an even integer less than 100 or whatever. And so you can really start defining the types of data you expect and wherever you find yourself, you know, with any dynamic, with any dynamic programming language, um, that anything that doesn't have like strong typing, you're always going to run into problems where you're, you're passing in the wrong kind of parameter and it's, it's kind of hard to debug, whatever. So if you think you have an, er uh, an issue with a function there, you just add a spec to it and you turn on the spec and the system will tell you if you're calling it wrong. And it can get really, really complicated. It can be like, okay, it takes an even integer less than 100 or a string with three I's you know, in a row or it takes a map with a key uh, of payment denied. You know, If that's what your program logic is. <laughs> It's a little crazy, but you could do that. You know, you could do that kind of thing. All right, uh, it does. Uh, the it uh, sorry. It's self-hosted, so the it means ClojureScript can compile itself. So that 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 URL I posted before, how you type in ClojureScript, and ClojureScript itself compiles itself and shows you what it did. But from the command line, you normally use the Clojure, Google Closure compiler. Uh, similar sounding name, different thing. Um, some people don't like it because, yeah, another dependency or whatever, but the Google Closure Compiler is actually really smart. It really compacts and optimizes your code. It does a lot of dead code elimination, and it's really fast, so it's really a good thing. And you don't have to write code that the Google Closure co Compiler uh, understands the way it expects it because the Closure Script Compiler does that for you, and then it passes it through the Google Closure Compiler, and you get not a tiny <laughs> file, but you get a much smaller file for any real size program. You get a really good output. And you get source maps. And if you run on the JVM, you, can, you have the immutability that gives you multi-threaded, high concurrency kind of uh, uh, platform to work with. OK, in summary, I say let's think beyond the syntax, OK? The parentheses, people really get turned off by the parentheses. I don't know why, but uh, just try to think beyond that, all right? Um, whether you're interested in closure or not, I would say definitely explore immutability and functional programming. I think a lot of things are going that way. Uh, there are a lot of new features in the last few years with JavaScript, and you know they're adding uh, more stuff along immutability and functional programming. Um, so definitely explore that. I think it's great. I think it'll make you a better programmer, even if you just end up using whatever your favorite language was before. I think it'll make you a better programmer with whatever you used. Um, I guarantee it. Money back guarantee. Okay. So resources, I actually also run the Clojure PDX meetup, so we're very friendly over there. So if you want to talk about Clojure, definitely come check that out. Clojure or Clojure Script. There are two websites for it. There's a free book called Clojure for the Brave and True. It's a very silly book, but it's fun. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you got to check it out. It's crazy. He talks about zombies and stuff. You have a program to, to reassemble zombies. Um, a couple great tutorials for Clojure Script. A bunch of IDEs, clips, the, the browser thing. Um, Atom, you know, Vim, Emacs are the big ones. Cursive is a big one if you're a Java programmer, is a pos is a because it runs on IntelliJ, and I think that people do IntelliJ. I don't know if any, other people do. And then there are other things there, other IDEs that you can work with. So if uh, if one of your favorite editors isn't up there, you can ask me, and I'll I'll find you something to work with. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. You're awesome. You're awesome. Hey, do we have any questions for Julio? Yeah, back there.
Um, I'm just kind of curious how good um, ClojureScript interop is with like like third-party JavaScript libraries. Like for example, can I use underscore or low dash without building my own wrapper around it? Good. It's a great question. Um, I believe so. In my opinion, the interop with any Clojure script library is pretty good. It's pretty straightforward to call any Clojure script function. What the challenges are with that is that if you are used to an immutable kind of world and you're calling out to JavaScript, uh, it's a big scary world out there. So you have to understand what's going on and what your call is going to do. So you can do that. Um, my other question though is I don't, I haven't looked at Lodash in a million years, but I don't know what it would offer you that probably wasn't already in ClojureScript, right? Because I remember like, oh yeah, I used to use it for like map and stuff like that, but that got added, you know, anything else like that, you know, pluck, all those kinds of functions are functional functions, they probably already in ClojureScript, and it, but if it has new things um, in it that you really use, yeah, you can totally do that. So you can call into that, oh, and there's a way to do, so like those maps are, uh, Closure script maps, there's a way to convert them into JavaScript objects or, uh, really easily, and then the other way around too. You can ingest JavaScript objects and make them closure script data structures, and then they become immutable and stuff, and you can bring them into your world. I will say another thing is if you have like, and this is, this is just a React thing. If you, you're trying to use React or whatever, and you're trying to add some other library uh, that also wants to write the fight, you know, control the DOM, then you're going to have problems there with React and closure script and your other library and what they draw and stuff. So there are rules and like strategies around that, around avoiding issues there. Thank you. Yeah, just one more. Or we can do the rest. Okay, two questions. Um, the first is, for does ClojureScript um, itself handle the transpiling or do you need something like Babel or such for it? And the second question is, probably my ignorance, but I always thought the JVM was one-threaded. So how does ClojureScript give you multi-threaded? So let me take those the other way around, backwards. Um, uh, JavaScript is single-threaded, um, but what Clojure give, ClojureScript gives you is core async, which allows you to simulate, uh, uh, well, it gives you concurrency in that one thread in a really easy, kind of natural way to do that. So uh, JavaScript, uh, so you don't get multi-threaded on JavaScript. The JVM is multi-threaded, and it does that really well. And uh, with Clojure, um, with its immutable and in, in some concurrency primitives it has in the Clojure JVM world, lets you do uh, multi-threaded parallel programming over there really easily too. All right. And as the first question, um, do you need Babel or something? Uh, no. You, there, it is hosted. Uh, ClojureScript is self-hosted, so you just need ClojureScript to compile ClojureScript. But if you want the best output, you've got to have the Google Clojure compiler. Um, and then there's like one tool with Clojure that you use for everything. So you don't need, I don't want to pick on, I don't want to pick on you guys. Right? You, you don't need Brunch and Broccoli and Babel and Grunt and, and you know, this and that and everything. You just need Line and it does all the comp compilation stuff you need for you. Yeah. Nope. Okay, great. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. You're awesome, Julio.